الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد so inshallah today we're actually starting the text of Imam Yusuf Nabhani and as we start the text you'll read very soon in his introduction that this text of Imam Yusuf Nabhani was actually taken from narrations that Imam Sakhawi rahmatullahi alayhi narrated in his Qawr al-Badi' So therefore it's appropriate that we discuss the brief biography of each of the two. Who is Imam Sakhawi rahmatullahi alayhi? Because we're going to be taking from his text. And since we're reading the text of Imam Yusuf Nabhani, who is Imam Yusuf Nabhani? Now for each of the two, lengthy biographies have been, uh, have been narrated, including uh, Imam Yusuf Nabhani. In this book itself, if you open the first few pages, there are a few pages dedicated to his biography. However, rather, rather than reading through it all, just a brief introduction, inshallah, we'll read through it, and then we'll get started with the class. <clears throat> Imam Shams al-Din Muhammad ibn Abdul Rahman al-Sakhawi, born in 1427 in Cairo, was one of the foremost students of Shaykh al-Islam Ahmad ibn Hajar al-Afqalari. He was a reputable Shafi Hadith scholar and historian. Al-Sakhawi refers to the village of Sakha in Egypt, where his relatives belonged. Among his numerous works are al maqasid al hasana and al qal al badi fil salah al habib al shafi The latter is considered one of the greatest and most comprehensible works written on the subject of invoking blessings upon Allah's Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Saqawi died in the 1496. And he is a scholar who Imam Nabhani is taking the narrations from, and he's taking it from the book al qal al badi which is one of the greatest books written on the subject of sending salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. Continuing on, with, Imam al-Qadi Yusuf al-Nabahani was born in Idzim in Palestine, now south of Haifa in Israel. He was an Islamic scholar, judge, prolific poet, and defender of the Ottoman Caliphate. His father, Sheikh is- Ismail al-Nabahani, taught him to memorize the whole Quran at a very young age taught him the sciences of Islamic jurisprudence, and then sent Imam al nabani to begin study at the University of Al-Azhar in Cairo at the age of 17. Imam it's interesting how many scholars, how many great scholars in Islamic history Al-Azhar University has produced. Some of the greatest scholars in Islamic history have been produced there. And the day that institute was produced, those who, the day that institute was established, those who established that institute never thought so many great scholars of this particular theology would come from there. Because Azhar University, in its origin, was not Sunni. It was actually established by the, by the Ismailis. And the first person to make it a Sunni institute was Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. After he t- took over Egypt, he then ter- converted a uh, Azhar University to a Sunni university, which then produced so many great scholars. Not to say either is you know superior or inferior, but it's just that sometimes you start something with one intention and how Allah takes it to another route and other people also benefit from it. Yes? Imam al Nabahani graduated from Allah Azhar in October 1872 at the age of 23 with qualifications from the official curriculum of Allah Azhar and many other qualifications obtained from extra study on, under multiple Islamic scholars in many of the sciences of the Sharia and its preparatory disciplines. After he graduated and returned home to Idzim, he began to hold a number of religious courses in Akka and his hometown of Idzim. He traveled frequently to Beirut, then Damascus, where he met eminent ulama. After Imam al nabahani retired, he turned entirely to writing and worshipping. He traveled to al Madina al munawwara and lived in the noble neighborhood for a while. Then he returned to Beirut, where he passed on the mercy of his Lord in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, 1932. SubhanAllah. Okay, so these are the two authors that we're reading about. Now we're going to start the author's introduction on page 25. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the oft merciful, all praises for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. May the choicest blessings and peace be upon our Master Muhammad, the Master of the Messengers, and upon all his family and his companions. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone, who has no partner. And I bear witness that our Master Muhammad is Allah's servant and messenger. Allah has sent him as a mercy to all the worlds. As to what follows, there are forty narrations a hadith on the virtues of sending prayers, salawat, on the Prophet wasallam, which I have selected from the book Al-Qawl al bali by Hafiz al-Saqawi, 
Rahimullah. They are as follows. So now he's starting with the text itself, hadith number one. Number one. Abu Masood al Ansari al Badri, whose real name is Uqba ibn Amir, radiallahu anhu, reported. So here it starts off by saying that this narration is narrated by Abu Masood al Ansari al Badri. Abu Masood al Ansari al Badri, whose real name is Uqba ibn Amir. Now you notice that in his name we read the word al Badri. Now what does that mean? Anyone know? Most times that means he fought in the battle of Badr. However, when it comes to this particular Sahabi, this is a big issue of debate. Did Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari ever participate in the battle of Badr or not? Usually when that Badri is mentioned after a Sahabi's name, that means by default, that person participated in the battle of Badr. However, some scholars say he did, some scholars say he didn't. Imam Tabrani says that the people of Kufa, they say that he participated in the battle of Badr. However, the people of Medina Munawwara say that he was not from those who participated in the Battle of Badr. When he says the people of Medina and Kufa, he's referring to the scholars of Kufa and referring to the scholars of Medina. Similarly, Imam al-Bukhari was of the opinion that he did participate in the Battle of Badr. But there's a large group of scholars who say he was not one of the Badri Sahaba. That if he wasn't a Badri Sahaba, if he is a Sahabi who participated in the Battle of Badr, then we have no question, we can continue reading. But if he didn't participate in the battle of Badr, then why is he being called Badri here? So the reason is because, some scholars they say, because he spent some time in Badr itself. He descended into its well, and he took water from there. Therefore, because of that connection of his, he then became known as Al-Badri, as a place where he stayed, as opposed to participating in the battlefield. Like I said earlier, however, those scholars who do say he did participate in the battle of Badr, then we have no question at all. Yes? And the hadith continues. Allah's Messenger وسلم, came to us while we were in the gathering of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the leader of the tribe of Khazraj. And Aus and Khazraj were the two main tribes of Medina Munawwara. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was one of the leaders of the tribe of, of, of Khazraj and one of the early people to accept Islam. And he lived during the life of the Prophet and later on in his life he passed away in Sham. Some scholars, they narrate incidents of how he passed away. One of the more common narrations that's quoted by Ibn Sidin and others uh, is that Sa'ad bin Ubadah was in Sham and he went to use the washroom. And while he was using the washroom, he was standing and urinating. And for whatever the cause may be, and this caused offense to a group of jinn, which then in return killed him. And the announcement was made that we killed Sa'ad bin Ubadah. Um, he passed away. His body was found in his washroom. That's agreed upon. His body was found in Sham, that's also agreed upon. But the incident of him standing and urinating and that the jinn called this out is something that's debated. Like I said earlier, Ibn Sidin narrates this incident and he says that this is his opinion on the matter. And there are other scholars who also narrate this, not one scholar, many, a few scholars do. But then there are other scholars from the other side who then argue back and say that, that the narration and the narrators of this particular incident, that part of the incident, are questionable. So therefore, they, they, they disregard it altogether. Yes. Sa'ad sent Bashir as the Prophet وسلم, Allah has instructed us to send prayers upon you, Messenger of Allah. So how do we send prayers upon you? Allah's Messenger remained silent to the extent that we wished he had never asked him. Okay, so the Sahabi said the Messenger of Allah, Allah is commanding us to send sal- salawat upon you. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyuhu alladhina amunu sallu alayhi. Allah is commanding us to send salawat upon you. So how do we send salawat? That was his question. فَكَيْفَ نُصَلِّ عَلَيْكَ how do we send salawat upon you? Now when you ask this question, the companion says, فَسَكَتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went silent. And there was this pause, this silence that occurred in the gathering. حَتَّى تَمَنَّيْنَا أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَسْأَلْهُ Until we desired that only if that guy didn't ask, why did he ask the question? There was a look on the Prophet's face that was a dislike. There was something that was bothering the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and he was silent. So now the question is, why was the Prophet ﷺ silent? And why was the Prophet ﷺ displeased by this question? Do you guys understand that? Why was the Prophet silent? And why was the Prophet ﷺ displeased by the question? Because when you look at the question, it's very simple. Oh, Messenger of Allah, how do we send salawat upon you? It's a very simple question, but why did it bother the Prophet ﷺ? So the scholars, they engage in different answers. Some scholars, they say, the reason is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an 
on many occasions prohibited the companions from asking extra details unless they were given by the Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He mentions the Jews of Banu Israel and how they were told to sacrifice the animal and that should have sufficed for them. Rather what they did was they asked again and again and again and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one narration said that it was their abundance of questioning that actually destroyed them. And when I of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا تَسْأَلُوا عَنْ أَشْيَاءٍ تُبْدَلَكُمْ تَسُؤْكُمْ Don't ask about those things that if they're clarified for you, they'll become difficult. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't like people asking questions on matters unless they were delivered to them, especially when they came to the details. He didn't prefer that. Now, um, beyond that, why is the Sahabi actually asking? Why is he asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If Allah is saying, send salutations upon the Prophet, they knew the Arabic language, it wouldn't be so hard for them to compose a sentence saying, Oh Allah, send salawat on the Prophet. It wasn't that hard. But why did they ask the Prophet wasallam? So the scholars, they engage in a discussion here. One group of scholars, they say, the reason why they ask this question, in Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, in his Fatuh al-Badi, he discusses this in detail. He says the first opinion, the reason why the Sahaba asked the Prophet wasallam is because they wanted to know the exact wording that was required to send salawat upon him. And because this was a Qur'anic command, they wanted to make sure that they did not violate the command of Allah to any degree at all, so they wanted the exact wording. Another group of scholars, they say that their questioning wasn't actually about the words that were being used, the exact love that they were going to use to send salawat on the Prophet. Rather, their question was more about, O Messenger of Allah, Allah is telling us to send salawat upon you, and the word salawat comes in different meanings, so which one of the meanings should we intend when we're sending salawat upon you? You guys understand that? And we talked about this in great detail, what are the different meanings. And this opinion is quoted by Qadi Iyad rahmatullahi alayhi. He was a great Maliki scholar. He quotes this opinion. And Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahmatullahi also narrates, narrates it in his Fatuh al-Bari. Now there was a great scholar by the name of Abu walid al-Baji, who is an Andalusi scholar and also has a great Maliki scholar. He brings this discussion together and he says that this question of theirs was actually a very important question. The question the Sahaba asked, it's a very important question. Why is it an important question? He says, the reason is because we learn from this hadith, as we continue reading, that the companions say, O Messenger of Allah, we already know how to send salam upon you, but we don't know how to say salat upon you. Okay? And how do we send salam on the Prophet? As we pray in the salah, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. That's how we say it. As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now because this companion asked this question, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, had the question been irrelevant, Allah would have responded with the exact same wording by saying, As-salatu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You guys understand the argument he's making? Just as the wording in As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi is, if the question was irrelevant, then the same answer would have been what? As-salatu alayka ayyuhan nabi. But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does respond, he doesn't respond with the exact same wordings as salam. He uses a new set of wordings, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. So this question opens up a new door, a new understanding of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now once we understand that, the next important point to understand is the actual wording of the salawat we use when we read our salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let's read the hadith and I'll explain it as we go along. Then Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, why did, the Prophet, why did the Prophet pause there? The reason why he paused is because Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُحَىٰ The Prophet وسلم, didn't speak from his desires. When he was asked a question, if he knew it, if he had already been informed by Allah, he would answer it. But if he had not been informed regarding that particular issue, then he would wait for the revelation. The revelation comes to the Prophet wasallam. He then relates it to the people. Now this revelation is not considered Qur'an. Revelation is of two types. Wahiya matlu, wahi ghayr matlu. The recited revelation, which we call the Qur'an, and the unrecited revelation, which we call the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Because everything the Prophet wasallam said is also divine, yet it's not equivalent to the Qur'an in its, in its, in, in its revelation. This is the recited revelation, that is the unrecited revelation. So now the Prophet wasallam is informed, and now he relates it to the companions. Yes? He said, say, O oh Allah, bestow favor... So he's telling the companions, now... This you ask the question, Fakulu, now this is your response. When you're making dua, when you want to send salutation upon me, this is the way that you're going to send salutation upon me. Now another one thing one other thing I want to mention 
is that the companions when they're asking the Prophet ﷺ on how to send salawat on the Prophet, it's because, and you know I asked earlier, why did he actually ask this question? You know how I just brought that up right now? Another group of scholars, one opinion that I'll, that I'll also add to that is the scholars say, the reason why he asked was because he wasn't just asking about how to send salawat on the Prophet, it's that this verse was commanding the companions to also send salawat on the Prophet in salah itself. You guys understand? Allahumma anta salaba minka salam, then after that, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And since that dua was going to be a part of the salah itself, the companion wanted the exact wording. O Messenger of Allah, because it's going to be a part of our prayer, we don't want this person reading something, that person reading something else. Let's have a uniform method, O Messenger of Allah, which is the dua that we should read while we're in salah. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa commands them, qulu, and then he gives them the dua. When there is a dua related by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we should match our words with that dua. We shouldn't add or, del- add or delete words, or exchange words. For example, the Sahabi says, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi narrates in his Anadab al-Mufrad, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the Sahabi the dua to read before going to sleep. What's the dua to read before going to sleep? Oh, that's a small one. Allahumma bismika mutu ahya. By the way, that dua comes in many different wordings. Okay? The other dua the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the Sahabi was, Allahumma aslam tu nafsi ilayk. وجهت وجهي إليك وفوضت أمري إليك وألجأت ظهري إليك رغبة ورهبة إليك لا ملجأ ولا منجأ منك إلا إليك آمنت بكتابك الذي أنزلت ونبيك الذي أرسلت The one who reads his dua and goes to sleep if he passes away on that night Allah will forgive all of his sins if he passes away that night, if he doesn't wake up that night, Allah will forgive all of his sins. And my teacher, I remember when we read this hadith, he said that from the day I learned this hadith, I haven't slept a single night without reading this dua. And he told us as well, students, promise me that you will read this dua every night when you go to sleep. Our teacher, our teacher Sheikh Junid Desai. So, in this dua, one thing interesting is the Sahabi, when he learned this dua from the Prophet, he read it back to the Prophet. Oh, Messenger of Allah, you just taught it to me, now listen to me. So when he started reading it to the Prophet, he said, Allahumma aslam tu nafsi ilayk, wajah tu wajhi ilayk, wa fawwat tu amri ilayk, wa aljah tu dhahri ilayk, rahbatan wa rahbatan ilayk, la malja'a wa la manja'a minka illa ilayk, amantu bi kitabika alladhi anzalta. Now the Prophet taught him after that to say, wa nabiyyika alladhi arsalta. What was the word the Prophet taught him? Wa nabiyyika. However, when the Sahabi read it back, he said, wa rasulika alladhi anzalta, arsalta. He used the word rasul instead of nabi. Now, in essence, if you look at it linguistically, which word is greater, Rasul or Nabi? Rasul is higher, right? Rasul is the messenger. Nabi is lower to the word Rasul. The Prophet told him to say Nabi. What did he say? Rasul. What did the Prophet say? The Prophet said, no, that's not what I taught you. You were taught the word Nabi. Read the word Nabi. And then the Sahabi went back and he repeated it with the words, wa nabiyyika alladhi arsalt. And this is the narration, by the way, Imam Bukhari rahmatullah quotes it in his Allah al-Mufrad, you can read it there with the words. So when we read a dua in the hadith, we should try to match the dua with its words. However, if someone is unable of doing so, they don't have good memory or they just forget it, then try to match it to the closest of your ability. Yes. <laughs> the Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, say, O oh Allah, bestow favors of Oh Allah, Allahumma. What does the word Allahumma mean? Allah, we understand, means Allah, the name of Allah, right? Hu Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu. That's the name of Allah. What does the humma there at the end mean? The meme at the end, the scholars, they say, is actually the badal of harfu nida. Badal means it's a replacement of harfu nida. So we should be saying, Ya Allah, salli ala nabi. Oh Allah, send his salutation upon the Prophet. But rather than saying, Ya Allah, Ya, the Ya there, rather than saying, Ya Allah, we remove the Ya and we replace it into a meme and we say, Allahumma. So the meme is a replacement of the word Ya. Yes. Oh Allah, bestow favors upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, just as you had bestowed favors. Now the scholars, they say regarding Allahumma, Imam Hassan al-Basri, he says something very beautiful. He says, Allah, man qala Allahumma, sa'ar Allah bi jami'i asma'ihi. The one who says, actually no, Nadr bin Shumail, he says, whoever says Allahumma, when making dua, he has asked of, he has asked Allah with all of his names. Hu Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Malik al-Quddus al-Salam al-Mu'min al-Muhaymin. He says Allahumma, and that will suffice him of the nine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hassan al-Basri, he says that Allahumma mustama'ad dua. That Allahumma is the gathering of all the du'as. 
So when you say Allahumma and make dua, Allah loves that so much that He'll give you much more than what you ask from Him. Yes. Bestow favors upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Okay. We already know what bestow favors. Here he's translating bestow favors as salli ala Muhammad. I already gave the linguistic breakdown of that previously. And we also understand the importance of setting salawat on the Prophet. But here, no, it doesn't only say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. After that he says wa ala Ali Muhammad. And also on the family of Muhammad. Well, now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is instructing us to send salutation upon the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the question comes up, is it permissible to send salutation upon other than the Prophet? And we already discussed this in great detail in the last week's class, that can you send salutation upon the family of Muhammad? Can you send salutation about, uh, upon other Prophets? Can you send salutation upon individuals living during our time? We discussed this in great detail in last week's class. I won't repeat it again. However, what I will discuss today is where it says Ali Muhammad, the family of Muhammad, who is this family of the Prophet referring to? Is it his daughters? Is it his wives? Is it his grandchildren? Who is it referring to? So what the first opinion on this matter is that it's referring to Banu Hashim. Banu Hashim are considered as the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone know who Hashim was? Muhammad ibn Abdullah bin Abdul Muttalib bin Hashim. Hashim was the the great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he's so the children of Hashim who are Muslims all fall into the word of Ali Muhammad. The second opinion is that this refers to the children of Hashim, but in particular Banu Abdul Muttalib. So within the children of Hashim, his son Abdul Muttalib, it refers to the Muslimin in that family there. This, the next opinion after that, this refers to the children and wives of the Prophet ﷺ in particular. So it refers to the children of the Prophet ﷺ and the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. The fourth opinion is that this refers to everyone who follows the Prophet ﷺ until the Day of Judgment. So we all get lucky in that one. Right? Everyone who follows the Prophet until the Day of Judgment. And the last, opi- last opinion in this matter is that This refers to those who are God-fearing from the Ummah of the Prophet Those who have taqwa, those who are God-conscious, it, it is directed to them from the Ummah of the Prophet Yes. And the family of Muhammad, just as you bestowed favors upon the family of Ibrahim. Okay. Now here we notice that the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Oh Allah, send salutation upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you sent salutation upon Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim. So the question here is that the Prophet ﷺ is greater in rank than Ibrahim ﷺ. And because he's greater than him in rank, then why is he saying, Oh Allah, send salutation upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you sent salutation upon Ibrahim? You guys understand the question? Right? When you're, when you're asking Allah for something, you ask for Allah something greater than you. And this, technically speaking, the Prophet ﷺ has the highest rank. So why are you saying, Oh Allah, send salutation upon me and my family, as you send salutation upon Ibrahim? So now I'm going to start to get into a detailed discussion in this matter. Qadi Iyad al-Maliki rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, that here the Prophet ﷺ is making this dua, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed his favor upon Ibrahim alayhi salam throughout his life until he had passed away. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam similarly wanted the favor of Allah until he passed away. The complete favor of Allah until he passed away. And the Prophet is instructing the companions to say this while he's alive. You guys understand? And Ibrahim alayhi salam has passed away. So he's saying, Ya Allah, finish your favor upon me as you finish your favor upon um, Ibrahim alayhi salam. The second opinion in this matter is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he's saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim, I want you guys to pay attention now to the, to the punctuation. So he's saying, oh Allah, send salutation upon Muhammad, period. What did I put there now? A period. If I put a period there, that means that sentence is now complete. The new sentence is, wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim, wa ala ali Ibrahim. Oh Allah, and the family of Muhammad, just as you favored Ibrahim, and the family of Ibrahim. So when he's saying, Oh Allah, bless your favor, just as you, just the favor you give to Ibrahim and the family of Ibrahim, he's not asking for himself, he's actually asking for his, he's asking for his al. Istanafa. Istanafa means he starts a new sentence. So Ali Ibrahim, wa ala Ali Muhammad is a new sentence. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim, wa ala Ali Ibrahim. 
Now, the reason why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Ibrahim ﷺ specially is because Ibrahim ﷺ had a very unique place with Allah and he was the Khalil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a very, very close friend of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ desired this for his ummah, therefore he mentioned Ibrahim ﷺ and his salawat upon him for the ummah. Now, okay. Now one thing the scholars, they mention here is that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is making du'a, he's saying, "Wa ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim." Now the word used ala ali Ibrahim is general, which means the family of Ibrahim. So the children that were born from Ibrahim alayhi salam until the day of judgment, who are the believers, they all fall prey. They are all targeted in this du'a. That oh Allah, just as you favored all of them. It's not only referring to the prophets, it's referring to everyone. Anyone that you favor, prophet or not from Ibrahim alayhi family, similarly just as you favor them, favor my ummah too. That's why the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our favor, the Prophet asked for us, wasn't only similar to the pious people from Ibrahim alayhi family, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them with the favors that you give for the prophets from Ibrahim's family too. Just as you favored Ibrahim alayhi children and granted them nubuwa and granted them wisdom and you favored the believers and amongst the believers, the prophets and non-prophets, amongst my families, meaning all those who come until the day of judgment from the believers, bless them all, just as you favored them. Yes. And bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, just as you have blessed the family of Ibrahim throughout the world. Indeed, you are praiseworthy and majestic. And peace, salam, is the way you already know. So, wassalamu kama alimtum. So, in the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also instructs the companions, wassalimu taslima, and send salam on the Prophet too. So, the Prophet, rather than repeating how to send salam on him, he says, You already know how to send salam, I already taught you that. At tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu tayyibat. Assalamu alayka, ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, you've already been taught that. Yes. No, the statement, Allah has instructed us to send prayers. By the way, that narration we just read, it ends there. It is narrated by Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih. Yes. Note, the statement Allah has instructed us to send prayers upon you refers to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah sends blessing upon the Prophet and his angels ask him to do so. You, you who believe, ask Allah to send blessings upon him and ask Allah to grant him peace. The Prophet's words, peace is the way you already know, means he taught it to them, taught them it before. Hence, there was no need for him to repeat it. They are the, they Therefore we learn that du'a should be taught and learned. Just as we learn the Qur'an, spend time learning the Qur'an, it's important that we similarly learn du'as. I remember one of my teachers, um, Shaykh Abdul Rahim, he once said in class, that after I had memorized the Qur'an, he was young when he finished memorizing the Qur'an, he said, after I had finished memorizing the Qur'an, my teacher then made me memorize Hizb al-Azam. Hizb al-Azam is a collection of du'as. It has like, I mean, I, without exaggeration, probably hundreds of du'as in there, hundreds of du'as. He said, my teacher memorized, made me memorize the full book. And since that day, I've never been short on making du'as in my life. When I'm ready to make du'as, I just raise my hands and I have this non-stop dictionary of du'as is ready and going and going and going. So just as we learn our Qur'an and learn surahs and so on, it's also important that we teach our family how to... And there are some du'as that are very important. So for example, the du'as that we read throughout the day, for eating, drinking, sitting, walking, descending, ascending... All these du'as, these are all there. We should memorize them. We should memorize these du'as and have them at the tip of our tongue and our children too. And then there are some du'as that are not associated with their particular time and place, with a, dama, with a zaman and makan. However, they're very important because the Prophet regularly recited them. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, the favorite du'a of the Prophet, the most recited du'a of the Prophet is which one? Anyone know? The most recited du'a of the Prophet, one of his favorite du'as, he used to always recite it. When he was doing tawaf, when he came to the last part of the tawaf, he would recite this du'a too. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ It was in Ali radiallahu for those of my friends who are not married, Ali radiallahu anh, he used to say, Hasana here refers to a beautiful, pious wife. What did he say? It refers to a, a desirable spouse. For men and women both ways, he used to say hasana here. So that when, I remember when we read this, all of my classmates started reading this du'a now. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa fiina adam al-nar. Gee, they are the very words a person performing ritual prayer salah says in the tashahhud. Prophet, may peace be upon you, along with Allah's mercy and His blessings. Yes, hadith number two. 
Anas reported that Allah's messenger Anas radiallahu an is a close companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who met the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after he arrived in Medina and was with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam until the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away. He served as a servant of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and was a part of the household of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for 10 years and he narrates his hadith. Anas reported that Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said People, the safest of you on the day of rising from the terrors and the various stages of that day. So, the Indeed, the person that is most safe from you on the day of judgment, from the difficulties and punishments of Allah on that day, is who? Yes. Will be those of you who sent the most prayers upon me in the abode of the world. Because every time you send salat upon me, Allah sends ten upon you. Okay? And every time you send salam upon me, I respond to you and give you salam as well. We read this hadith already. So, whoever sends most salawat on the Prophet in this world, he will be the safest person from Allah's punishment, the furthest, most security around you, for the one who sends the most salawat on the Prophet. Yes. Indeed, it is sufficient that Allah sends blessings and His angels ask Allah to do so. He said, the greatest, in this narration, Anas radiallahu anhu says, the greatest virtue of sending salawat on the Prophet, above all, is that Allah and the angels did it. The fact that Allah and the angels did it, that's more than enough. What more do you want? What, what greater virtue can there be than that? That you would have the opportunity, you know, for example, if someone gets to wear the exact shoes Michael Jordan wore, how would they feel? MashaAllah. Right? If someone would get to lie down on the exact bed that Muhammad Ali lied down on, you would say, MashaAllah. You'd feel honored. Because you're joining that person in some sort of an action. So the greatest thing here is that you're joining Allah and the angels in an action. Allah and the angels are joining. They did something and they're giving you a chance. Hey, this is a group of special people. Why don't you join us too? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Yes. For Allah has said, indeed, Allah sends blessings upon the Prophet and his angels ask him to do so. Allah instructed the believers to do the same so he may reward them for it. Hadith number three. Abu Huraira of the Arabu reported that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Whoever sends one prayer upon me, Allah will send ten blessings upon them in return. This is actually a part of a principle of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amthaliha. Whoever brings one good deed to Allah, Allah will bless them with ten. Whoever reads one letter of the Quran, they are given how many rewards? Ten. And the hadith says, Wala aqul alif la mim harf. وَلَكِنْ أَلِفٌ حَرْفٌ وَلَامٌ حَرْفٌ وَمِيمٌ حَرْفٌ I am not saying that Alif Lam Mim is one word, so you're given ten rewards for saying Alif Lam Mim. Rather what I'm saying is Alif is one harf. Lam is one harf. Mim is one harf. So when you say Alif Lam Mim, how much reward have you gained? Thirty. Can you imagine what kind of cash register kids are banking in on when they're reading Quran all day? You can't. But the only thing is, that these young men and these young girls that are studying, they haven't been taught this virtue, so they're not, they, it's not in their intention. So when they're reading it, they may be getting the reward, but that spirituality isn't increasing. You know, when you want something, if you know what you're getting, that's when you have a desire to do it, and you do it with your whole heart of this. Like you really dedicate yourself to it. I really wish our children who memorize the Quran were taught the virtues of reading the Quran thoroughly. I wish they had these hadith memorized. So when they're reading, they know what they're doing. And students of knowledge, I really hope that they have a hadith regarding seeking knowledge memorized. You ask today a student of knowledge, narrate to me 30 a hadith on, memori- on, on seeking knowledge. I'd be surprised if he can narrate more than five. I'd be surprised if a student of knowledge can narrate more than five. If she can narrate more than five hadith. And if they made it to ten, that's really big. Thirty or forty, forget about it. How long there are so many a hadith. So what ends up happening is that when you're studying knowledge... It just becomes ritual. You're just doing it for the sake of doing it. Mom and dad are paying tuition. I have to show up here every day, attend class every day. But the greater purpose behind it, we, have, we don't know. So that's why it's important that we have the virtues down. Because they also serve as motivators. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if you, send one good, if you do one good deed, Allah will give you ten rewards. So if you send salawat on the Prophet, you'll also get ten. Now this, is this the same reward for all other du'as? Mm. Not necessarily. Because there's a difference between a good deed and a dua. The scholars say the reason why it's in this dua is because this dua, Allah is considering it as a good deed too. 
as a form of ibadah, as a form of worship. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's commanding us that you send, now we're not worshipping the Prophet, I want to make that clear, I've said this a few times in the past, I'm saying it again, we're not worshipping the Prophet, but it's something so beloved to Allah, that we do it for the Prophet, and Allah loves us in return, and gives us 10 in return. Just as if you did one good deed for Allah, Allah would give you 10, 10 times the reward. And by the way, that's just the beginning, that's not the maximum. That's the minimum promise by Allah that this is what I'm going to give you. More than that, you put more heart into it, you shed a few tears, you think of the Prophet's life, you really sincerely give that salawat, and you know, the sky's your limits. Even beyond that. Yes. Peace number four. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu reported that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Abdullah ibn Umar is the son of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. He is one of the great companions and is from the Mukathirin, those who narrate hadith abundantly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So is Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. So is Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is also one of the companions who narrates from the Prophet abundantly. Yes. He heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, when you hear the muazzin, repeat. When you hear the muazzin, repeat everything he says. And when you hear the muazzin, the muazzin is who? The one who calls the adhan. And also, the word muazzin is also extended to the one who calls the iqama to. The one who calls the iqama is also referred to as the muazzin, and the one who gives the adhan is also called the one who gives the muazzin. Adhan ayu adhinu means to announce. Wa adhin fil nas bil haji, as Allah commands Ibrahim alayhi salam to announce, to to call people. So muazzin is the one who calls people towards salah, the one who's making the call for salah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling the companions, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ الْمُؤَذِّنَ فَقُولُوا مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُوا When you hear the mu'addin give the adhan, it's important that you respond to him with the same words that he says. Why is that? You know, people ask me all the time, that, you know, how do I learn to focus in my salah? How can I build my attention in my salah? So I always tell them, the biggest mistake people make is that they start their salah with Allahu Akbar, when the Imam says Allahu Akbar. Without realizing, Salah actually starts much earlier than that. When does Salah actually start? From the moment the Mu'adhan says Allahu Akbar. Because now you're told to respond to him. So that way, he is not the only one that's calling, but you're actually calling yourself. You're reminding yourself that Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, out of all the things that are great right now that I can do in this world, Allah is the greatest. What matters most in my life? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Not running around, not playing sports, not going to the gym. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. That's what matters most. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's what matters most. And if I do follow through with this, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala falah, Allah will give me success. And my success will be, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. That I'll die with the kalima, la ilaha illallah. Right? So there is a great spirituality within the adhan itself. That's why the scholars say, whatever it is you're doing, you need to stop. If you want to become punctual in your salah, again, you want to make salah a part of your life, Bring Adhan into your life, Salah will become a part of your life. Today in America, Adhan is not a part of the life of the Muslim. How many of us even hear the Adhan? And those of us who do, and I have this belief that many Muslim children grow up into the age of puberty without hearing the Adhan of Fajr even once live in their life. I believe this. Many Muslim children reach the age of puberty without even hearing the Fajr Adhan once live with their ears. They, never, they don't even hear it once. Maybe in adulthood they hear it the first time the Muadhin saying it. The rest of it is all re- written in books and through recordings. As for the adults, most of us never heard the Adhan. You know, our, our rendering of the Adhan or our hearing of the Adhan is on our phones. And even that, the poor guy on the audio doesn't make it past Allah Akbar once. <laughs> Allah, he gets cut off, right? It's like this, we've created this great tendency to just right away, right away. But Adhan, will never, Salah will never be a part of your life until you learn to do what the Prophet said. And what did the Prophet say? That when the adhan goes off, don't silence it. Silence yourself. Whatever it is you're doing, stop. You know, your heart's, your hand's dying. You say, I want to press the button right now. But what do you say? Don't press the button on your phone to stop the adhan. Shut your mouth. Why don't you get half that effort there? And everyone stop. It's not that long. Let's just honor the call to Allah so we can agree the time has started. And ultimately, this reminder again and again the sincere call to Allah will then lead us to salah one day, inshaAllah. Bring the adhan into your life, Allah will bring salah into your life. Yes. When you hear the Muazzin, repeat everything he says, and then send prayers upon me. Whoever sends one prayer upon me, Allah will send... Okay, so now after the adhan, we need to make a dua. Okay. First of all, during the adhan, we respond to what's being said, and after the adhan, we need to make a dua. The scholars say the dua, the responding of the adhan, is not limited only to the adhan, it's also with the iqamah. So when he's giving the iqamah, we should also repeat with him. 
And after the iqama, should there be a dua or not? Some scholars say yes, some scholars say no. Some say after the adhan, after the iqama, you immediately start your salah. While others say no, after the iqama, there is a dua. And there's a very famous um, narration. Ibn Rajab, he narrates it in his commentary of Bukhari called Fathul Bari. There are, there are two famous Fathul Bari. One is by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani was a teacher of Imam Sakhavi who wrote Qawr al-Badiyah. Okay? Then there's another um, Fathul Bari written by Ibn Rajab. And he is a Hanbali scholar. He was born in Baghdad and passed away in Dimash. He is the student of the great Ibn Qayyim. And one of his students is actually also another very famous scholar. His name is Imam Zarkashi. Imam Zarkashi, rahmatullahi alayhi. He is the student of Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. So Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali narrates a narration from Hassan al-Basri that he says, Hassan al-Basri says, إِذَا قَالَ الْمُؤَذِّنُ قَدْ قَامَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَقُلْ that When the Mu'addin says, قَدْ قَامَتِ الصَّلَاةِ Then you should say, Allahumma rabba hadihi al-da'wa al-tamma wa salat al-qa'ima a'ti Muhammadin su'lahu yawm al-qiyama fala yaquluha rajulun hina yuqimu al-mu'addin illa adkhara Allahu jannah fi shafa'ati Muhammad yawm al-qiyama He says whoever reads that dua after the mu'addin says qad qamat al-salat qad qamat al-salat is said when? in the iqama whoever makes this dua after the iqama Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely give him paradise through the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning if he doesn't make it with his own deeds, he's going to hit the Prophet's intercession and that person is going to Jannah. Yes? Uh, whoever sends one prayer upon me, Allah will send ten blessings upon them. In return. Okay, so before we, before we move forward, let's... Um, so now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, let's read the whole hadith. Then ask Allah to grant me wasilah. Wasila is a place in paradise which is reserved for only one of Allah's servants. The Prophet is saying, when the Mu'adhan is giving the Adhan, repeat what he says. After he's done with the Adhan, you should send salawat upon me, send salutation upon me. And then ask Allah to give me al-wasila. So the discussion is, what is al-wasila? So the Prophet himself answers that. He says, al-wasila is a place where Allah has, a place that Allah has reserved for only one person on the Day of Judgment. It's the executive box. Right? You know in the United Stadium they have that executive box right at the top. There's one spot reserved on the Day of Judgment for one person. Not two. And the Prophet said, Arju an akuna. That I, ho- I wish that I am the one. Right? Hu ali, that it's for me. I hope that I'm the person who Allah has reserved that for. So the Prophet is telling the Ummah that I made dua for you all my life. Now it's your turn to make dua that I get al wasila. Yes. So whoever asks Allah for me to receive wasila, they will definitely receive my intercession on the day of rising. Arju an akuna huwa ana. The Prophet said, I wish that I am that person who receives al wasila. And if you ask wasila for me, it's impossible that you make dua for me and I won't make dua for you. You ask wasila for me, and I promise you my intercession on the day of judgment. Deal. Who is the deal with? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You ask wasila for me, and I promise you my intercession. Deal gone. You continue to make wasila for me, and I will make intercession for you on the day of judgment. Now when we look at the words of the dua that we read after the adhan, what are they? We start off by saying, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wat al Okay? Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wat al What is the word da'wat al Allahumma rabba, O Allah, the Lord of hadihi, this da'wat al this complete call. What is this complete call referring to? The scholars, they say, رَبَّ هَذِهِ الدَّعْوَةِ الْتَّامَةِ دَعْوَةُ الْأَذَانِ Oh Allah, you are the Lord of this call of Adhan. You are the Lord of this call of the Adhan. وَالصَّلَاةِ الْقَائِمَةِ And you are also the Lord of this prayer that we're about to establish. So the دَعْوَةِ الْتَّامَةِ is referring to the Adhan. صَلَاةِ الْقَائِمَةِ is referring to Iqama. You guys understand? دَعْوَةِ الْتَّامَةِ is referring to Adhan. Salat al qaimah is referring to the? The iqamah. The iqamah that's made right before the salah. Ati Muhammadin al wasila. Ati means give. Muhammadan, give Muhammad al wasila. Give him al wasila. What is wasila? We just talked about it earlier on. The Prophet ﷺ, he told the companions that you should make dua for me that I am given, I am given al wasila. And that is the highest rank in Jannah that Allah has reserved for one person. Ati Muhammadin al wasila wal. Fadila and give Muhammad Fadila to. What is Fadila? So the scholars they say Fadila is a rank above the creation in this world. Wasila is the highest rank in the 
hereafter, Fadila is the highest rank in the in the world. That's the highest rank. So we're asking Allah, Oh Allah, give our Prophet Ati Muhammadin al Wasila hereafter one Fadila and also the highest rank in the world. One Maqam al Mahmud. What is Maqam al Mahmud? And this, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself uh, explained in one narration: Maqam al Mahmud is a praiseworthy station. And the praiseworthy station is the place that Allah has reserved for the Prophet so he can make intercession on the Day of Judgment. Right? It's the intercession. So we're saying, oh Allah, also allow the Prophet ﷺ to intercede on behalf of his ummah. Just as you promised him that you would give him maqam al-mahmud, maqam al-mahmud meaning intercession, make sure you give it to him on the Day of Judgment. Now the dua generally we read after the adhan ends with, إِنَّكَ لَا تُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ these words, inna kala tukhliful mi'ad, are not narrated in the most common narrations. Many scholars are even of the opinion that it's actually not a part of the dua of the adhan at all. It's actually not a part of the dua of the adhan. However, um, there is a narration quoted by Imam Bayhaq, he narrated in his sunan from Ali bin Iyad. He narrates from, it's basically a long narration, who says that, uh, Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu an narrates that at the end of the adhan, the Prophet said, he instructed us to say, Inna kala tukhliful mi'ad. So there is a narration in Imam Bayhaq bin Rahmatullahi alayhi sunan. However, in the majority of the authentic narrations, the, the, the dua ends where? وَبَعَثْهُ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا الَّذِي وَعَدْتَهُ That's where it ends. That's the end of the dua. And some scholars add, Inna kala tukhliful mi'ad, based off the narration of Imam Bayhaq bin Rahmatullahi alayhi. Yes. Uh, n- note. Ibn Hajar al-Makki Ibn Hajar al-Makki This is different from Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani That's someone else This is someone else Yes Stated in al-Dur al-Mandud Fi al-Salat al-Sahib Al-Maqam al-Mahmud Where he summarized al-Qawl al-Bari That the meaning of the Arabic word In the aforementioned Hadith text Halat is So the Prophet said If you make dua for wasilat for me Halat lahu shafa'ati I will Halat Hallat is the word there, okay? Shafa'ati. My intercession will become Hallat for him. I'm not translating the word Hallat intentionally because he explains it here. He says, Hallat a wajabat. Meaning that my intercession will become wajib for you. You make wasila for me. You know how it's, it's a two-way deal? The Prophet is saying, make dua for wasila for me and I promise that I will intercede on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. Yes. It will become incumbent, just as the Messenger wasallam has stated explicitly in several authentic narrations. And the meaning of it will become incumbent is that it is guaranteed and will definitely happen due to a true promise that was made. So he's saying that the Prophet says, you make dua of wasila for me, I promise it's wajib that I will most definitely make intercession for, uh, on your behalf on the Day of Judgment. So he's saying that, can anyone doubt this prom- promise of the Prophet? Yes or no? And it's not in one narration, it's actually in many narrations. So no person can deny the promise of the Prophet. So what does that mean? So Ibn Hajar al makki says, what this actually means is that Allah is giving you a little secret. And what is the secret? Allah is telling you that you're going to die with Iman. Why is that? It's because the Prophet can only intercede on behalf of the Mu'minin on the Day of Judgment. So you make dua of wasila for the Prophet. In return, Allah will give you death on Iman. It's a little secret that Ibn Hajar al makki is sharing here. Yes. In this, there is, the great, there is great news for everyone who recites this dua, that they will die upon Islam. For the intercession will only apply to those who depart this world as Muslims. Allah, what a beautiful point that he brings out in the Hajar al-Makki uh, while teaching us this. We'll read one more hadith and we'll stop. Yes. Number five. Ibn Umar radiallahu and Abu Huraira radiallahu reported that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Send prayers upon me, Allah will send blessings upon you. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Send prayers upon me because your prayers will be multiplied many times over as a reward for you. Ali ibn Abu Talib radiallahu reported that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, your sending, pr- your sending of prayers upon me is a protection for your own prayers. Du'a. You send salutation upon me, muhrizatun li du'aikum. It's actually a protection for your own prayer. Remember how I said that when you send salawat on the Prophet, Allah accepts your du'a? Remember the narration? That Sahabi came, made du'a quickly and left. The Prophet said that, what are you doing? If you didn't send salawat upon me, your du'a is suspended. Go back and make salawat upon me. Then he taught him how to make du'a properly. We discussed this narration already. 
It is pleasing to your Lord and is a purification for your actions. It'll it'll protect your dua, sending salawat upon me. It'll please Allah and it'll also purify your actions. All of this is being done by sending salawat upon me. So why would you not jump onto it and make this a part of your life? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ali Sayyidina Ibrahim innaka Hamidum Majid wa sallallahu ta'ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.